Khalif Browder's story is one that inspires change. Through every injustice that Khalif faced, he tackled it head on, not letting up for a second. All to fight for the one thing he knew he had, his truth. We are your hosts, Sherry Ferreira and Helen Allen. This is The Chalk Line. Good evening, everyone, and the highlights of the news this Thursday. So this week we are discussing Time's documentary, The Khalif Browder Story, and you haven't heard of it, no, right? No, no. I mean, I've heard of it, but I haven't looked into it yeah. really. So I'm super excited to deliver it to you and to our listeners. Um, immediately, it's a docu-series, so there's six parts to it. It opens up and it lets you know Jay-Z is involved. So that's why I know it. It's a- <laughs> No, literally, he really did help, like propel this case farther than just like the regular news media outlets he's a producer on the docuseries and after he found out what Khalif went through he really just came through and was like I hear your story it sounds amazing how can I be involved I love that I mean really like whatever it takes you know to get these stories heard I think some people it rubs them the wrong way when celebrities feel like they are like, I, I've seen people be like, okay, celebrities think they're so important to have a voice in this stuff. And it's like, well, come on. Like, how do you win here? Because they have this huge audience that they reach and nobody knows these stories. So why don't just, like, be grateful that people are talking about it no matter who it is? I agree. It's a rough balance between people being like, oh, you're only doing this because it's popular. But then it's mm-hmm. like, I agree with you. Like, regardless, it's a celebrity. They have a big name for a reason. Let them push it out right like I know that John Legend has worked with like he made a documentary that was uncovering a bunch of injustices also that like nobody had heard of before he made the documentary that was really good maybe we'll do an episode on it in the future but I'm just like <laughs> that's my thing is that I'm just like I don't care how we got from point a to point b are we at point b cool yeah. you know what I mean if if what it takes for everybody to hear about this case is for Jay-Z to produce something about it, then by all means, now we know about it, now people care about it, and people are going to fight for the justice that, you know, these cases deserve. So, okay, off my soapbox, but that's how I feel. (laughs) I mean, truly, and so much reform happens as a result of everything Khalif went through, as um, tragic as it was, but Jay-Z discusses um, meeting with Khalif, so they actually did meet, they took pictures, I'm sure he was, like, so excited. And he describes Khalif as a prophet, almost. And at first, I was like, okay. A classic Jay-Z, like, Oh, my God, what? <laughs> really doing Just, it up. You doing know the he, most. <laughs> a prophet. And he ex- goes on to say how sometimes prophets come in the form of young children to change the way the world is. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, that's beautiful. And after, like, really getting into the details of what Khalif went through, I'm like, okay, yeah. Yeah, because at 16, this is a lot for someone to take on. Well, and I mean, if there are prophets walking among us, it's not like it's going to say it on their forehead. Right. We're not going to know. Right. I don't like, I'm not going to carry on a sign. Maybe Jay-Z is here to tell us to deliver the world's <laughs> Lord, right. the Lord's word. I mean, truly. This docuseries tells Khalif's story through several interviews after the incident, police footage during the whole ordeal, and flashbacks to just several depositions that Khalif had to go through, which are... Um, they're basically conducted to get the person's account of what happened. And a lot of what happens is them making sure what you're saying is accurate. A lot of it is some discrediting of what you went through. So right. we do hear this firsthand of Khalif mm-hmm. um, telling what he went through. Okay, so when it came to making a podcast, we knew what we wanted to do, but we just didn't really know how to execute it. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from this podcast, too, like with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. 
Sarah's story starts in May of 2010. Khalif was 16 years old at the time. And in an interview he did a couple of years later, Khalif says he used to love sports, playing football, going to parties, going to the park because he lived near the Bronx Zoo. And I'm like, oh. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, we gotta have fun. I would have been so jealous of that. Now, right. I, now I hate zoos, but oh my God, right? when I was 10, though, that mattered. You would go bonkers. Being near a zoo is everything. Bonkers. I'm sure. During this interview, Khalif is on um, the busy streets of New York, and he's seeing all these, like, businessmen in their suits and businesswomen walking around and he points them and he's looking up to them and he says he wants to be successful just like them and he really wants to emulate like that like professional like air you know okay yeah so he has this like wonderful vision for himself he lives in the Bronx and it's safe to say he had a rough childhood the area is very impoverished and it has a heavy police presence that from Mm -hmm. which is not a healthy thing i mean like it sounds like oh the police are there to protect but we already know exactly it's they're very targeted against black youths and like from what he explained from it it sounds like you always have to be on sort of like a survival mode like you're 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 always on high alert because like how many times are you just in the wrong place at the wrong time and black exactly and especially in the bronx like I could not translate what growing up in the Bronx could be and, like, we, so and, like, eloquently. We don't understand it fully, but, like, I'm sure just based on the things that we know about how people were treated in the city and black and youth, like, it just, the whole package of yeah. it, I could understand that he probably walked around constantly on high alert. Exactly. We hear more about Khalif's childhood, and he was raised in the foster care system and into child protective services. Because his mother was addicted to crack. Now, this is very important because you can already see Khalif is familiar with this sort of system. Yeah, and and I'm sure, like, from a very young age, being put into... I mean, I actually can... I wasn't personally in the foster care system, but my siblings were. Yeah. And it completely changes your perspective of life when you see that system at such a young age. And you born into it, so I can't even... Yeah, so, I mean, already I can assume that he became a very mature person very fast mm -hmm. because, you know, the foster care system, it doesn't let you be a child. Yeah, and you really see that through his, like, adult responses to everything. He's just Mm -hmm. so, he carries himself like an adult. I'm sure. Khalif is then given to Vanita Browder, who is already raising two of his other biological brothers, Kamal and Dion. And in that, he has an extended family with Kamal, Dion, Nicole, a sister, Akeem, and Rahim. So not from the same family. They just were already there, and they were raised together. Okay, so Kamal and Dion are his biological siblings, and then he has three other siblings in his foster family. Yes. Okay, I understand. (laughs) And they describe Khalif as, like, having all this pent-up energy being really fun, but equally as annoying. (laughs) I love that. And I was like, As I know you. I cannot resonate with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, really. I mean, I was like, I know exactly who you are. There's a Khalif in all yeah. of us. Yeah, <laughs> truly. Like, they just all seem to have this, like, mentioning annoying moments that he had, but smiling at oh the God, same I time. I love that. It was beautiful. I love because also, like... We never get the, like, raw what these people were actually like in all of their moments. When we are doing our research on these cases, we only hear the, she lit up a room and all this mm-hmm. stuff. But they're, like, downright to it. No, he is annoying. as hell. I love <laughs> like, Because you can also be a great person and be annoying. Hello, uh, here I am in this room. I'm a great person, <laughs> but am I annoying? No. I can tell you what. Literally what Khalif's brothers thought of him, like, at one point, I feel, um, his older brother was like, we were playing football and he joined, and I don't know what he was doing, but it wasn't playing football. And I'm like, oh my god! That is so funny. Okay. I love it. While Khalif was raised in the foster care system, I'm not sure if it really registered or really, like, took on the gravity of, oh, I am adopted, because it later goes on in the doc to say that he found out he was adopted at 12 or 13. Oh, okay. So maybe he just, I mean, you said that he was raised in the foster care system. Maybe he was so young that his, his like, adoptive mother just kind of chose not to really speak about it. Yeah. Okay. I know that happens in a lot of families. Um, Not mine personally, because my mom was just like, you're adopted, so what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I remember 
I'd love your like, mom. I know. Love your mom. And, like, she used to make me so mad because she would say, well, yeah, um, you're, I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus here because there's literally eight of them, but, <laughs> um, but she would, like, be like, your adopted siblings came from my heart, but you came from my stomach. And I was like, oh, what, the, what the hell? It made them feel so chosen. And I was like, so what you're saying is I just happened in your stomach? Yeah. I was like a seed you pooped out? Yeah. What, what the hell? <laughs> No, but it was sweet. And and yeah, so I, I mean, not part of my family how that worked, but I'm sure, I mean, just like so many families, like people just kind of choose to not talk about. Yeah. And around the time that he did find out he was adopted, his father also left him. So this left him feeling a bit lost and really looking to find a family through friends in the neighborhood. Like we said before, we have no idea what it's like growing up in the Bronx, but from, it seemed like the regular, like, day-to-day was, or relaxing, was going to parties, doing some not-so-legal behavior, like, just, like, getting... Being a teenager. Yeah. Being a teenager. Yeah. I, every, like, article or documentary we read, they're like, "Uh uh-oh, they... They did stuff, and it's like, all right, they were, they were a teenager. Yeah. People try things. Exactly. And Calm down. Not Truly. the first or last time we heard that people tried things. Yeah. <laughs> More seriously, though, Khalif does end up getting arrested later on for stealing a bakery truck and joyriding. Khalif? Yeah. Where did you get that? I know. His I don't... mother is, like, obviously extremely upset, mm-hmm. but one of the officers was like, oh, were you hungry or something? And it's like, oh my god, <laughs> You're I'm ridiculous. Great. Can you please? Excuse me? This is like, mm, not the time. Yeah. Not the time. <laughs> but I also am like, where the hell did he get a bakery truck? No, truly. <laughs> and this is just like one of the things. I'm like, it's just a regular. Bakery kid. Truck? Yeah. I mean, really. No, but okay. So yes, that sounds like, well, if one of my siblings did that, I'd smack them upside the head. Of course. But, you know, he didn't come from... The easiest life. So we have to look at this with a different lens. A hundred percent. Khalif was convicted on a felony charge for this and was given five years probation. And this is important because it puts him on police's radar. You know, a kid with a record. And kind of what we were saying in the Sandra Bland episode, once you have that on your record, police can kind of do anything with you on your second arrest because... They'll say, like, well, you were already a f- an offender before. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it if he was already walking around on high alert before this, I'm sure it is a completely escalated feeling now. A hundred percent. And that's, that's like, the perfect segue, I think. Okay, and let's yeah. go right into it. I'm going to be sad. I know it. <laughs> it's May 15th, 2010. And like I said, after we just recapped his childhood, he is 16 at this point in time. Okay. Khalif was walking home from a party with one of his friends. They had just left and they were looking to have some fun. It's 2 a.m. and they're walking along Arthur Avenue. Ugh. It's Arthur Avenue has the best food. Really? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, like, next to Little, it's little like Italy. Italian yeah. Food. Oh, it's the best. So it's quite. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I say the exact from you. TikTok? I love oh, it. It's the best. That's the best. <laughs> Me and my girls, we're going to go to TJ Maxx and we're going to go to Off Avenue. <laughs> so it's a quiet night and the streets are silent. It's very, you know, that. And as they passed east and 186th Street, Khalif notices a police car driving toward them. The officer pulls up claiming that a backpack was just reported missing and they were identified as the thieves. <sighs> Both men deny having any involvement, and the officers search them and find nothing. Khalif even says, like, check my pockets. I don't have anything on me. Did not do it. This I- is so <laughs> sad because, like, I mean, I don't know where this leads, but for him to be like, look, I-, I swear I'm good. It's like, it doesn't really matter if you're good. It depends on if that cop is good, you know? Uh, <clears throat> literally. Literally. So one of the officers walks back to his car where we find out the alleged victim is. Like, he's sitting in the cop car telling them and identifying Khalif and the, his friend as the thieves. Oh, oh my god. After talking to him or her, because we don't know, the officer informs them that actually the robbery, 
the robbery didn't just happen. Um, they robbed this mysterious victim about two weeks ago. Oh, convenient, because they didn't find the backpack. So yeah. So they're like, oh, it happened way in the past. Like, already, sh- shit's stirring. Shit's a stirring. Both Khalif and his friend are then handcuffed and put into the police car. Khalif says, this is him speaking, what, what am I being charged for? Got I didn't it. do anything. And he remembers telling the officers all of this, attesting to his innocence, like, numerous, numerous times. Mm-hmm. And the officer even tells him, we're just taking you to the precinct. Most likely you can go home. So. That's it. Oh, my God. Okay. Khalif even whispers to his friend and is like, are you sure you didn't do anything? But his friend uh... also says he did not do anything. They must have been so scared, too. I mean, 16, Uh, you're a baby. Like, I know you're a teenager and that makes you feel really grown up, but you're also a baby and you're driving in a police car. It's scary. A hundred percent, especially since he has that other, um, he's still on probation at this time. Exactly. So there is that immense fear, but they are brought to the 48th precinct where they get fingerprinted and are put in a holding cell. His family gets word of this, and to them, they're a little bit more relaxed. They think it's just a routine stop and frisk because officers frequently pull kids in off the street. Ugh, but Don't this, get me started on stop and fucking frisk. I'm, I... But the thing is that this happens regardless of a reason. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of it is used to unfairly search people of color. In Khalif's neighborhood alone, there was a reported disproportionate amount of black and latino kids being pulled for stop and frisk than white kids absolutely i mean most of the time it is just literally like well we heard the suspect was a black man so he stopped every single black man i ever saw like there's basically no rules you need to have a hunch and then you can just stop whoever the hell you want and pin anything on them and if it's if you find something you weren't even looking for then someone's screwed exactly so it's like in this sense, Khalif's family are not so worried because they're like, this is routine. He'll be out soon. Like, whatever. Right. Over time, the witness does change his story. Over three times, actually, that Khalif did do it. He didn't do it. And he, like, contradicts himself or herself constantly. Mm-hmm. To this point, we still don't know. I mean, even the victim's records where they have to attest to, like, the facts of what happened, they mess up the date of when the robbery even happened. First they say May 2nd, then they say May 8th, and I'm like, can, then why, why is he here? So I am to believe that the victim is white, because I'm like, why do the officers want to hear this janky story and keep these two kids if it's not they're supporting a white victim and putting these black people, like, in, you know, just a completely lesser position? Agreed. And... He just ends up changing his story so many times. It's clear they don't have any evidence on either of them. Mm -hmm. They're just pulled in for questioning. 17 hours later, 17 in central booking. No, have they been held this whole time? Holy shit. They're brought in for questioning and Khalif is still maintaining his innocence. The next day he was led into a courtroom where he learned that he had been charged with robbery, grand larceny, and assault. Grand larceny for a backpack? Well, from what the doc said, I didn't write down what the contents were inside specifically, but there was a camera, some cash, and a couple other things, but nothing to lead to grand larceny. Let's just say that. I mean, grand larceny is like a a bank. Huge. Right? You'd think that'd be something for like- It's like a heist. Right? I'm like, where is- He's 16. What kind of dramatics are- I am- I'm very confused. What judge would sign off on that for a backpack? Well, the, <laughs> literally, that was funny. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh. Why? Because <laughs> you're like, I don't know what judge would sign off on this, but what the fuck? Ever? I'm no like, judge, but I wouldn't sign off on Grand Larson's. Yeah. Like, it would have was it a Jansport? Yeah. <laughs> LA people. No, truly that. It's like it was like a fancy ass North Face like, backpack with like five compartments it was, in it. It's like under $200. It's not grand larceny. Like, calm the fuck You better down. have fucking rubies and diamonds in that right. backpack. The judge releases his friend and lets him remain free while the case moves through the courts. But because Khalif was still on probation from stealing the truck, the judge orders him to be held and sets the bail at $3,000. Okay, so I want to know where the evidence to keep Khalif is. And here's the thing, too, is that I'm sure, and this is me assuming, so please tell me if I'm wrong, 
I won't. But the justice system really caters to white people. And this huge police presence in Khalif's neighborhood, like, didn't really give him a sense of his rights within the justice system. He should not have been held there for 17 hours with they had no evidence on him. He should not be paraded through a courtroom just because he had a prior thing and, and there's still no evidence that he did this thing. Like, where's the footage of him doing it? Where's the actual vis- victim testimony that makes any sense? Like, how can a judge keep him for this long? And it sucks because the family should be able to advocate for him, but I'm sure they're kind of in the dark about his rights. They are 100%. And that's the thing about this case is that at every step, like, they failed him. Right. Truly. Like, they didn't have any concrete evidence. They didn't have, like, they only had a one testimony. And by they, I'm, I'm just clarifying this for listeners, by they you mean the justice system. Yes, the justice system. Oh my god, yes, the justice system failed him. Unfortunately, the family did not have the funds to bail Khalif out, and that is not their fault. Of course not. I mean, this is the same thing that we spoke about last week Mm -hmm. with Sandra Bland. It's like, sometimes bail is just something you cannot make, no matter, like, what your situation is, no matter how hard you want to help the person you can help. Like, sometimes it is borderline impossible, especially if you're a family in the dark about, like, you don't know about a bail bondsman or, like, situations like that, like... At all, especially considering that Khalif's neighborhood was, I don't want to say severely impoverished, but they were impoverished, not in the best condition. Mm -hmm. And it was reported that in his, in his area alone, 85 to 90% of people already couldn't make bail. Mm. Like you were just stuck. That's really so sad. They later find out that the bail gets denied because he violated probation and they put him on hold until the case was resolved. But this is so crazy. He violated probation, but there's no proof of it. Like, he violated probation by, what, getting rearrested just because he looked like he could have done it? Like, I think that's what they mean, but there's no, like, even reason for him to get arrested, which is why it's like, he's just slipping. Or unless was he not supposed to be out at 2 a.m. partying? Could that have been... Like, I'm just trying to grasp that straws to understand what in God's name could have happened here. It never gets brought up, but they say that he was put on hold because he violated probation. So Mm. there must have been something in there. I mean, there. Either about a curfew or him not being even allowed to be rearrested, even though he was brought in for questioning. Like, it's all these small cracks that he's slipping through. They're just trying to make something stick. Exactly. Khalif is sent to Rikers Island to await trial after being charged with robbery. Now... I think it's important to say that there is an immense amount of pressure on anyone in Khalif's neighborhood, especially black youths, um, Latino, Latina youths, to take a plea deal and admit guilt just to serve the minimal amount of time because Mm -hmm. the system is so fucked. Well, and also they can't really afford a great attorney who is going to fight to the death for them. Like, they're probably going to get a public defender who God knows what they can do for them. And then it's just... You know, which is what happens here because his public defender had like a caseload of a thousand, which is a whole separate issue within right. the system. And nothing and so, against public defenders because they really are doing God's work. But like, it's too much to be a public defender with, especially in a city like New York City. There's so many cases to conquer, and there's not enough public defenders. To where stuff like this ends up happening, yeah. which is not right or not an excuse by any means, obviously. But of course. It just but needs it to be corrected. Like, it's a system. Every yeah. time, every turn so far has just been like, wow, it's a very fucked system. Exactly. And even if you are innocent completely, like we will see in this case, you will get fucked over for a variety of different reasons. Like whether that be the arresting officer was just an asshole or like he wa- it was racially motivated, like it, it's it's fucked. Right. And I mean, already this officer patrolling around at 2 a.m., like, he was probably, like, under a preconceived notion that he was going to stop a black man. Like, yeah. you know, I I mean, of course, like, he was because he was looking for a black man to fit this victim's description or whatever. But, like, that in itself makes it already, like, okay, I saw one. I believe it's him. Then that's, like, mm. they're just waiting for something to stick. For those of you who don't know, Rikers Island is notorious for corruption mm-hmm. on the part of the correctional correctional officers, several human rights violations just in terms of the treatment of the inmates, and yeah. it's it's literally known as New York's Guantanamo Bay. I mean, the prison system all across the country is fucked, but Rikers in particular is g- grotesque. Yes, 100%. And at the time, um, I think it's also important to note that New York was... Um, 
one of only two states that automatically charged kids as adults once they turned 16, which is why he got sent to Rikers. Oh my god. It's it's one of the most violent adult jails in the country. Just to like give you a small idea of what Khalif was going through, literally when he first arrived, he was sent to the adolescence, which housed inmates from 16 to 18, and it was nicknamed like the volcano because of how explosive these teenagers are. Immediately, Khalif was jumped by eight or nine guys while he was making a phone call. Just oh. right off the bat. Oh my god. And throughout his time on Rikers, he had thousands of delays in his trial just due to sloppy police work. Like, that's the best you can chalk it up to. The caseload of these um, public defenders, the judge, like, it just kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And he was in this horrible environment and no one truly gave a damn. He suffered amounts of abuse from correctional officers to inmates he was starved and they really just it's like the dehumanization dehumanizing yeah we work this is dehumanization of belief and the Um, way he was treated so sad and yet throughout all this he maintained his innocence khalif says quote I felt like something needed to be done about this. If I just say that I did it, nothing's going to be done about it. I didn't do it. No justice is served. Nobody hears nothing at all. I had to fight. And I'm like, at 16, you're taking on this entire system through this like numerous amounts of abuse, especially considering one of the plea deals that was offered was for him to just not serve any time. And he's like, no, I didn't fucking do it. Right. And on top of that, like even... He didn't, I'm sure. But even if he did, is that justification for the treatment he got afterwards? No. Like, this is such a corrupt system because it puts... Like, we're not positive he did it at this point. And yet he's still being treated like absolute human garbage. This is not okay. And the only thing they have is a witness, but the witness isn't even... um, Reliable. Yes, it's not a reliable witness. So what the fuck is he doing waiting trial... In Rikers Island at 16. It's so messed up. Khalif was told by multiple people that this case would blow over, like he would be out in no time, and that the case was straightforward because they truly had nothing. I mean, there was no evidence, like I said, besides this one witness who wasn't even reliable. And you would think something would happen and that he would be released sooner, but that's not what went down at all. Mm. Khalif would go on to serve three years in Rikers awaiting a trial that never even (gasps) happened. Oh my god. Two years Uh, in solitary confinement where he (gasps) made several attempts to end his life. And Oh my god. He he just oh my god. Like he was truly a fighter. Like the bravest kid. And not even, like, it doesn't even matter at that point. It's like what what in God's name are we talking about a speedy trial? Like there are literal serial killers who have had shorter awaiting trials than this. Like, I'm sure even shorter sentences. Like, let's be real. This is just so crazy. I mean, for what? We're not even sure. Sh- Where's the backpack? Did they ever even, like, There's have an n- idea of what he might have done with it if he did do it? Like, that is the thing is it's like, just show me at least one shred of evidence here. They had Nothing. Nothing. One other example of the treatment that Khalif, while he was at Rikers, happened on September 23rd, 2012. This footage was published by The New Yorker. Please go look at it. The link is in our bio. At this point, um, in his, and it's crazy because I can't even say at this point in his sentence because he was literally just awaiting trial. Like, at this point in his what? Like, he was just in Rikers. It's... Yeah. Okay. Anger aside... At this point, Khalif had spent a total of about two years in solitary confinement, including the nine months leading up to the incident shown in the video. And again, like, he's not a violent person. Why is he in solitary confinement? We need to at least reserve that for the worst of the worst. You know what I'm saying? I think why he was in solitary confinement was because of the environment there. It's very much you have to fight. Like, and so I think through right. him trying so to survive. So he was defending himself. Yeah. He, I mean, of course. Just defending himself. Nobody is like an angel in prison. Of like, course it's not. It's too hard to be. 
especially here you're forced to fight back or else you will get pushed around and we'll get into more of that later and don't quote me on nobody's an angel in prison i'm sure they exist but but like you, you know they're in like them. the rich prisons I mean, where like where the they? situation was where he got like a haircut every day in prison you know like know. please it's, just like, I'm, it's way too hard to be perfect in prison it's of you're course. defending yourself you're fighting for your life of course now The footage and the incident we're talking about takes place inside Riker's Central Punitive Segregation Unit, better known as the Bing. And on this day, a guard went to escort Khalif to the showers, and this is what follows. Khalif sticks his hands out to be cuffed through, like, the little opening slot in his cell, Mm -hmm. and the officer does cuff him, but he's standing there sort of looking around a little bit. Um, and at one point he uses his walkie talkie. I'm not sure if they're waiting on Khalif, but they do open up the doors, which is why I'm assuming he was on the walkie talkie. And the guard walks with him, not even two feet when all of a sudden he slams his head into a pole, (gasps) grabs him and then slams him down into the ground, like throws his body down. The guard is pushing his face into the ground with, you can just see the force and the marks on his, like, hand as he's pushing his head down. And Ugh. it's extremely obvious that this was unprovoked. Oh, my God. Like, just attacked him because he could have. Right. Because he could. It's just a power trip. Not only did Khalif have to worry about the guards, but he also had to be aware of the other prisoners um, and the just the other people there. Rikers is heavy with gangs, and Khalif was very adamant about not wanting to join one because if he did join, then he sort of had to abide by their rules, like give up his commissary, make all these other sacrifices just to be protected and a part of their gang. Right. And at every instance, Khalif held on and stood up to these gang leaders saying, I'm not going to be pushed around. I mean, at one instance, they spit in his face and he fought back, even though everyone was like, you shouldn't do that to this guy. He was like, no, I'm not getting treated like that. Khalif does um, get released in 2013 and all the charges are dropped. Oh, thank God. Which I'm like, that sigh of puts relief. puts my heart at such ease. But I, I'm so relieved he got out, but it's like the amount of mental and like physical violence he suffered. It's just, it's hard to celebrate, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like, there's so many issues with Khalif's case. It's within the system. I believe a lot of it, and you could tell a lot of it, is racially motivated. Right. And one of the reasons that also gets brought up for why this sort of all happens is budgetary. Like, there are just not nearly enough judges and court staff to handle the workload. In 2010, Khalif's case was one of 5,695 felonies that the Bronx District District Attorney's Office prosecuted. So, and that's basically all to say it's a whole lot of cases and so a lot of people just get the treatment that Khalif did they get a weighted trial at these huge prisons that they should never be at and then nothing happens I can't imagine it's cheaper for them to let him sit in a cell than it is to just give him bail like they denied bail from him and it's like if anything is gonna make the court more money it's letting people pay bail exactly of course his family couldn't afford it but then on top of that they slapped them in the face by saying and you know what you couldn't afford it but also you don't get it anyway like that is like incredibly fucked like how is it cheaper to hold him in a cell than it is to let this 16 year old go back home to his family it's so backwards especially with no proof he is a non-violent offender he has never hurt anybody like 100 percent. which is why i say like a like it, it it has to do with like it's racially motivated it absolutely a little bit. is now in when he is released in November of that year, so 2013, Khalif files a lawsuit against the NYPD for wrongful arrest, the Bronx DA for malicious prosecution, the Department of Correction for wrongful arrest, and being beaten, starved, and tortured at Rikers Island. That gets thrown in there as well. <sighs> Khalif has this interview in 2014 after everything he has gone through. And I mean, I don't mean to gloss over every terrible incident that Khalif suffered. I mean... It is truly horrific. The examples that I mentioned don't cover it nearly enough. But if you do want to grasp the full gravity of what he went through, there's a link in our bio from this woman who interviewed him from The New Yorker. And it goes into great detail of what he suffered and what he went through. And, you know, honestly, like, 
you and I are the type of people who can hear this story and be satisfied with wanting to fight for them just based on hearing it. But unfortunately, the reality is some people have to see how inhumane all of this stuff really is. So it it might be important for some people to watch that stuff and really see it and see how disgusting it is. Because if it's not in front of someone's face, they're going to be like, oh, he like suffered a little bit. Like, all right, whatever. excuses as to why it's not happening or why it's not so bad. And so, I mean, yeah, if... If you're already not feeling very passionate about what's happening here, then you need to watch the video. Yeah. In this 2014 interview, Khalif says that he has demons that simply won't leave him. He can't sleep at night. And whenever he has like a minute alone, he thinks about the trauma and pain he endured. Oh my God. My two year solitary confinement for a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. His mother, Vanita, says physically he'll be right in front of you, but mentally he is not there. And you can sort of see that in this documentary, his distant gaze. And you can see, like, moments where he's disconnected a bit. And Yeah, I mean, he, like, he's going to have to do some serious, serious work on his mental health to get out of something like yeah. this. This is not something that you just get out of prison and everything's okay after no like you will always hold that huge burden of how heavy it all was a hundred percent he says that he 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 struggles to be reintegrated in society Mm -hmm. like that's the biggest thing and that's the thing is that we have a very bad system in place for exactly that like reintegrating everybody into society after especially for people like him who were nonviolent offenders. Like, I don't know why it has to be so hard to get them the help that they need to become members of society again. I know. It's... <sighs> like, simply slapping a probation officer that has way too many cases is not enough. Like... At all. Putting a, one probation officer on the case is not enough. They need to be given therapy, and they need to be given resources and outlets for their anger like there needs to be some sort of follow through yeah that just doesn't happen and at all angles and it's 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 like they pluck these kids off the street and then just toss them out well absolutely i mean he was like without better words like he was literally plucked right off the street one night and then his life changed forever and then when they released him with no apology for everything that he endured they were just like, mm, and now you just get to suffer with it. Like, there's no... Oh my god, it's I know. So it's up. it's I... a very crazy case. Upon Khalif's return, over 11 attorneys said that he had no case before he filed this lawsuit. Oh but god. Paul Prestia, a civil rights attorney, had faith that Khalif had a case and that it was an issue with the city of New York. Absolutely it is. Khalif... Um, like we said, suffered a lot of trauma from his experience. He said that he can't really be happy to be home because he never should have been in prison in the first place. He had his childhood taken away and he doesn't fit into society anymore. All his friends are at different sort of points in their lives than he is. I mean, No one understands him. Exactly. He's now placed in a place where everybody is like oh we missed you i'm sure but like they they don't know how to relate to him anymore he doesn't know how to relate to them it's too tough like he was ripped out of his life for what from his experience at rikers khalif like we said a lot of those demons just violence and psychological damage that he suffered at rikers and unfortunately he took his own life on june 6 2015 he was 22 at the time and His story prior to his death did blow up and raise a lot of awareness to the injustices in the criminal justice system. Barack Obama banned solitary confinement for juveniles and cites him in like his um, document, I guess you could say, but he, he, he causes so much change to happen and it's it's unfortunate that it had to happen, but it's no. Yeah. And that is huge because I mean, for minors and juvenile, you know, for juveniles, your brain is not fully developed. And there are so many studies on how solitary confinement messes with your brain as a fully developed adult. So I cannot imagine how much worse it is to put a juvenile in solitary confinement. At 16. Like he is, like I said, a baby. After his death, his mother, Vanita, continued to be an advocate for Khalif's story and reform in the system. She didn't want her son's death 
to be in vain. Mm. Um, now, unfortunately, his mother does pass in October of 2016 due to a heart condition she had. Um, now, Khalif's siblings sort of carry on that torch, and Khalif's brother, Akeem, created the Khalif Browder Foundation, and their vision is to use social justice discussions, civil engagement programs, and mental health awareness to engage and ensure change within urban communities. In 2019, New York City did pay $3.3 million to the estate of Khalif, but I'm like, it's... That's like a little too late. It's a little too late. It's obviously not nearly enough, and it's just what... Because Barack Obama said that what you did was wrong, so you're just going to throw money at it now? You already ruined a family. You absolutely tore a family apart, and I'm sure it's not the only family in that year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure it's not even the only family in that week. Like, this system is so fucked up. And cool, like, $3.3 million goes to the estate of Khalif, but he's not here to see it anymore because of what you did. Like, it makes me so angry. And if anything, we can hope that Khalif's story will make it so that it doesn't get this far where the $3.3 million goes to the estate. Also, on top of that, you know, it's just, if at its core, the whole reason why this system was so messed up because of the, quote, budgetary confine, like, then then why is the $3.3 million able to be awarded to the estate now? Like, where was that money when it needed to be given to the justice system to do right by people? A hundred percent. It's like, you can come up with all of this after the fact. But to you, look good. But you cannot use that to prevent this from happening again. Exactly. I mean, I'm so tired of the aftermath being, oh, finally, a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's like, we didn't have to go through that tunnel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Close it. Close, Close it. The tunnel. <laughs> please. Put up a detour Jesus. sign. <laughs> Invest in a detour sign, please. Oh, my God. <laughs> Like I said, all of this comes from Time's documentary, The Khalif Browder Story, so please go watch it. It's on Netflix. Um, It's a great watch. And a couple of takeaways, I guess, from doing this story and reading about Khalif and what he went through is that this is very much unlike Sandra Bland's case, where there was one instance of racism or discrimination. Like, we know who was responsible for Sandra Bland and what happened to her. For this case... Oh, I mean, they're both, it's not like, it's like an apple and an orange. You can't compare it. But in his situation, it was everywhere he turned, he was failed. With with Sandra, we have one specific individual. And, like, he was helped by people to be shitty. But one specific person did most of the damage. But here, who do you blame? Exactly. It's sort of this system as a whole that failed him and countless other black youths from these neighborhoods that get targeted thanks for listening you can catch us on instagram at the chalkline pod twitter at the chalkline pod and follow along with our youtube channel the link is in our instagram bio tune in next thursday for another story guys this week we are actually doing a giveaway in honor of valentine's day um, <laughs> i don't know it's just kind no. of weird timing really our one year was this february and we're just celebrating as a whole but um there's some really good stuff in it so if you're interested in entering in the giveaway um and and winning some cool stuff then go to our instagram and yeah and if you're not listening to this episode in real time then you missed it <laughs> So sorry, but it was really fun. Like, yeah, I wonder who won. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. This is so, like, not meta, but, like, oh, weird. It's, like, my future, but my past. We're in the future. <laughs> oh, my God. Go check out our Instagram. It's at the Chalkline Pod. And there's some great. good stuff there. Yeah.